Hello, Abnormals! Welcome back to the Ministry of Abnormality. I am your host, O Abnormal, and today I'd like to talk to you about your strengths versus your weaknesses. So as always, let's start by me explaining what exactly I mean by this. Well, it's pretty simple. As an artist, you could say that your strengths are the things that you're good at. The stuff that you draw or, or paint or whatever, and it looks good. The stuff that you are quite skilled at producing. As opposed to that, your weakness is obviously the stuff that you're not good at. The stuff that you don't draw very well, that you don't get amazing results on. Or, on the other hand, the stuff that you just really haven't tried out yet. The stuff that you haven't really worked on, and therefore, you're not sure you're going to be able to do a good job with it. So naturally, our first question would be, okay, uh, why can't I just have a very, very, very big strength and disregard my weaknesses? And, well, really, the question almost doesn't even need answering. But I'm going to do it anyway, because you'd be surprised how many times in my life I'd had, I've had to have this discussion. It's really quite simple. If all you can do is punch very, very hard. Well, maybe one day you're going to find yourself in a situation where punching is not available. When I was a martial artist, I haven't done martial art in quite some time, I was training Shaolin Kung Fu. I was training Northern Chinese boxing style. Now, please, before anybody criticizes here, I don't know if it was legitimate. I did it for 10 years. It was good for me and, and, and all that. I don't do it anymore. I don't know if it was legitimate or whatever. But the point is, I was doing northern style Chinese boxing. And a lot of what I did was punching. It was very, very, very focused around using very quick, very, very precise punches. I trained for 10 years. And during those 10 years, I trained in the style that the school would train me. We didn't have much in terms of combat. We focused a lot on forms. You know, we, we would do like exhibition forms. And we focused a lot on punching. And we never used any protectors or anything like that, which wasn't really a problem because we didn't really combat that much. About 10 years into my training, uh, the people from the Shaolin school, and again, I don't know if it was legitimate or not. The point is, the people from the Shaolin school decided that they wanted to participate in tournaments. And at that time, I was the highest ranking student in the school. Just right beneath a uh, black, well, it wasn't a belt, it was more like a sash. But anyway. So they send me to this tournament, and as soon as I get to the tournament, I'm faced with the rules. Punching gives you one point, kicking gives you two. Now, first of all, the whole thing is ridiculous. Like, wh why does punching give you points and kicking gives you points? I mean, I'd never train like that. I'd never train for a tournament. Second, punching only gives you one point. That means I have to score two punches for every up kick the other guy is going to give me, who obviously had trained kicks. Oddly enough, not very good with his punches. Also, they put protectors on me. You know, the chest protector, gloves, the helmet... Do you guys know how difficult it is to fight with a boxing helmet on when you're bald? You start sweating. They hit you once, the helmet starts looking the other way, now you can't see. And you have boxing gloves on, so you can't really put it back in place. Anyway, these were the circumstances under which I entered the tournament. A guy that had trained punching for 10 years. And there I am. Punching gives me one point, and kicking gives you two. Naturally, I lost. And while it was okay for northern-style Chinese boxing to be mostly focused on punches, the truth of the matter is, you know what? During those ten years, I should have trained some kicking, you know? But I didn't. And that was my weakness. And I paid the price of my weakness by just, well, not winning the tournament. That was it. In art, things are pretty much 
that way. You can focus on something as much as you want. Let's say you are a person that draws pinup girls spectacularly. But that's all you do. All you do is draw pinup girls. If you narrow down too much what you're specialized in to the point that you just don't do anything else, well, that's really not the way life works, and that's certainly not the way this profession works. You see, you can't do everything. But on the other hand, you can't do just one thing. There's stuff I like and there's stuff I dislike. But work is going to sometimes cross a little bit in terms of what you have to do. Maybe your specialty is drawing sexy, scantily clad women. And that's great. But sometimes maybe that sexy woman is going to have to be accompanied by... I don't know, let's go like full tacky 80s here. Maybe she's going to be riding a tiger. Well, crap. I don't draw tigers. I only draw sexy, scantily clad women. Well, man, come on. I want her riding a tiger in the jungle. You tell me that you, in addition to your sexy, scantily clad warrior woman, you can't draw a tiger and the jungle? Most things don't exist in isolation. Most things have other things around them. So... As good as you might be at drawing sexy, scantily clad warrior women, uh, those characters are going to need accessories and are going to need to be places and are going to have pets and are going to have warrior men with fur thongs. You know, basically all the stuff that surrounds that thing that you're an expert in. And sure, you have a primary focus, but there's a lot of secondary stuff. And it's no good for anybody if you are amazing at one thing, but whatever has to be done in addition to that, you suck at. So, yeah, that's kind of the situation of why you can't be simply strong in one thing and disregard everything else. But okay, how do we go about fixing this? How do we go about getting ourselves out of a situation where we are only strong in one thing and we seem to be weak in everything else. Step one, understand that you are not supposed to abandon what you're good at. If you're good at something, why would you stop doing it? Think of all your artistic skills as if they were tools. Actually, that's what they are. Now, this also feeds into the why we can't have just one tool. Why can't we just have one skill? Well, imagine you're, I don't know, a carpenter, a plumber, a mechanic, whatever. And you just have one tool in, you, in your box. You just have a hammer. It's a good hammer. It's the best hammer you can get, but you only have a hammer. And if what you need to do doesn't require a hammer, well, then you're going to need other tools. But you're not going to throw away your hammer. You're not going to stop using your hammer. You're still going to use your hammer every time you need it. You're just going to add tools to your arsenal, to your toolbox. You're not going to stop using the hammer. You're not going to say like, okay, I got a wrench now. Goodbye, hammer. I'll never take a job nailing anything ever again. No nailing for me. I will never nail again. No. You will continue to nail and you will be good at it. You will still be great at nailing whatever comes across your path. But now you can also screw stuff. Now you can also, well, you get the point. So really, we're not abandoning what we have as a strength. We're adding to it. We're building upon it. And I call it the first step because I don't want anybody to ever feel what I felt when I was a student. And unfortunately, that's something a lot of teachers do. A lot of teachers assume the position where they absolutely demand that the student not use or not do whatever it is that they used to do before their class. And that just brings everything to a screeching halt. That really kind of makes you hit a wall in terms of your art advancement. So remember, don't discard what you have, build upon it. 
We're not taking away what you're good at. We're adding to it. Step two, and this is one of the most important ones for me. Understand the difference between I don't want to and I can't. And it's a very important difference to understand because every single time, well, not every single time, but most times when I criticize any of my students because of a weakness that they have, they come up with the explanation that it's that they don't want to do that. You know, the classic, you have to work on your anatomy. Oh, that's my style. Really? Is it? Or are you simply not very good at anatomy and that's all you can do with it? You only draw men. Well, yeah, I don't like drawing women. Really? I've never seen you do it. I've never even seen you try it. Why don't we see you draw a woman? Let's see if it really is that you don't want to or if it really is that you can't. And that's a huge difference that you have to understand. We all have that one person in our lives that claims to be a pacifist. But then you look at that person and they're like, wimpy. They couldn't punch a pillow without breaking their wrists. Now that's not being a pacifist. There's a phrase I learned. And it says something like, only with a capacity for violence can you be nonviolent. And it makes a lot of sense when... When you choose to be nonviolent, it means that you had a choice. You could have been violent, but you chose not to be. And therefore, you are a pacifist. You are nonviolent. All is well. Harmony and love. But if you didn't have a choice to begin with, it's not that you're nonviolent. It's just that you really just can't be violent even if you wanted to. There has to be a choice for you to actually be able to choose. You need to have the potential, the capacity, to do what you say you choose not to. So, there's a big difference between I don't want to do that and I can't do that. And that, in my opinion, is the first step to overcoming your weaknesses. Stop telling yourself that the reason you're not doing that thing that you're weak in, it's because you don't want to do it. Acknowledge that you can't, that you don't have the capacity and you have to fix that. And just because you have the capacity to do something doesn't mean you have to. But once you can, then you can choose if you want to or not. So it's a big difference and it's a very important step that you got to take. Next, you got to train what you're weak in. It's never going to improve if you don't train. And it's not going to be pleasant, but you got to do it. Think about when you go to the gym. Let's say you're a wimpy person with noodle arms. And you go to the gym. Your trainer doesn't tell you like, oh, look, you got wimpy arms. Let's never do anything with them ever. No. Your trainer says, like, oh, look at you. You got noodle arms. There's the bicep machine. There's some dumbbells. There's this. There's that. These are all things that are going to train your arm, and we're going to do a lot of it. You have to train what your weekend, and it's not going to be fun at first. It's going to hurt, and it's going to be hard, and you're going to suck. When you start lifting those weights, you're going to be able to lift very, very little, and it's going to hurt. And you're going to be sore and you're going to feel bad. But if you want to have strong arms, that's what you got to do. You're very bad at scenery. You can't do perspective. Well, guess what? You're going to have to practice perspective a lot in order to get good at it. You're not going to get good at perspective by avoiding it all the time. You got to go do it. And it's not going to be pleasant. But here's the thing. It doesn't have to be public either. You can train in secrecy. You can go hide yourself in a room and just do bicep curls until you get big arms. You can do that. You can go and practice your perspective 
on your own. You don't have to show it to anybody. You don't have to publish it. You don't have to put it online. You don't have to do any of that. You can do it in secret until you feel that you've improved. But you got to train it. Now, on the other hand, you can also just do it publicly. You can just try it out and show people and get advice and share it with people and get help that way. Whatever way works for you is good. If you don't want to show people your weaknesses, don't. If you're okay showing people your weaknesses, go ahead. Each one is going to have its advantages. But at the end of the day, the important thing is that you do actually train what you're not good at. It's going to be unpleasant. You're going to feel bad. It's going to hurt. And that's just the way it is. So you got to train. Like Bobby Chu once said, whatever it is that you're not good at has to become your new favorite thing to do. Okay, next, take it slow and slowly implement your new tools into your regular workflow. Okay, so let's go back to the example where you draw nothing but sexy, scantily clad warrior babes. And you don't do anything else. But for a few weeks or months, you've been secretly or publicly, whatever, training a little bit of scenery. You've been learning a little bit of perspective. You've been learning a little bit of environmental lighting, all that kind of stuff. You're still not an expert at it, but you're getting there. You're improving little by little. Well, then little by little, start incorporating that to what you were strong in. No, you don't have to go and draw a you no know, sexy warrior babe in like the most spectacular scenery the world has ever seen, but maybe start adding a little bit of background to your characters now. Just a little. Slowly start incorporating what you're learning into what you used to do. And progressively just start increasing it trust me it'll take off from there it's not going to like it doesn't necessarily mean that in the future scenery is going to be what you're all about no but maybe in the future you now draw very awesome sexy warrior babes surrounded by some very very nice or decent scenery or who knows maybe life will like take a huge turn Eventually, you discover that scenery is your new favorite thing, and now you just draw scenery and the sexy babes are more like a background element. And so, the next step is as we slowly incorporate our new skills into what we were already good at, and as we train those skills, don't forget that you can't stop training what you were already good at to begin with. Going back to the whole gym and noodle arm analogy, while you're training your noodle arms to get arms like legs, you can't stop training your legs, even if they were already muscular and amazing to begin with. If suddenly you just focus on your arms, your legs are going to get weaker. You have to train everything, and it all starts to accumulate, and yeah, it sounds like a lot because it is a lot. Hey, this job isn't easy. And I hope nobody's looking to get into art because they think it's easy. Because it's not. But the point is, you can't abandon your old skills for the new ones that you want to train. Because then you're going to weaken what you used to be strong in. So as you are training these new things... You have to continue training the old things. Remember, we are adding, not subtracting. Yes, your practice and your studies and your work regimen is going to get larger, but that's really just the way it is. So don't abandon the training of what you used to be good in. You're adding. And so here we are. We've established why we can't be strong in one thing and weak in everything else. We've acknowledged that we don't want to abandon what we're strong in. We want to add to it. 
we've faced and been honest with ourselves about the difference between I don't want to and I can't. We've acknowledged and faced the fact that training our weaknesses is not going to always be pleasant and sometimes it's just going to outright hurt. We will slowly implement these new skills into our strengths. Little by little, we'll start to add to what we used to do. And we won't forget to keep on training what we used to be good at. We won't abandon it. We won't forget it. We will continue to train that in addition to our new set of skills. So what's left? Well, one final thing that is very important to understand, and that's nobody is 100%. We should all strive for it. We should all push towards trying to be as good as we can in everything. We should always, always, always push for excellence. But understand that you're never going to be 100%. You're never going to be amazing at everything. And really, you don't need to be. It is okay to have a specialty. It is okay to be stronger in one thing. If I need a certain type of illustration, I have certain artists that I know are very good at that, that I will call. And using the example we've been using the entire video... If what you need is sexy babes in bikini armor, well, I'm really not the artist to call for that. I'm not very good at it. I try. You know, I try to sometimes draw something sexy. I'm just not very good at it. But that's okay. It's okay to not be good at everything. It's okay to have a specialty. Just don't narrow it down so much that you're only good at one thing and you suck at everything else. But you don't have to be amazing at everything. It's okay to be focused on one thing. So there you go. Dealing with our strengths and weaknesses as artists. Hopefully, this will help some of you, or some of us, deal with the realities of what we have to train, what we have to acknowledge, what we have to accept. It's difficult. Just don't lie to yourself. Don't convince yourself that it's that you don't want to. It's okay to not be perfect. It's perfectly okay. Now, if you like this video, please consider the whole YouTube thing, subscribing, liking. More importantly, I do have a Patreon that you can check out if you want a high-resolution version of the image that you just saw me make. Also the line work in case anybody wants to practice their coloring. On the other hand, if you want, you can leave a comment. Tell me a little bit about your thoughts regarding this topic. And hey, maybe you have more advice. I would definitely appreciate it. If you have any ideas for future topics that you would like me to talk about, please let me know in the comments or just send me a message anywhere you want. I'm very easy to find on the internet. I'm a webnormal. I hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you next week here in the Ministry of Abnormality. Thank you for watching or listening.